everybody. We are live and there's a picture of my family. Okay, that's last Christmas. So I'm looking forward to getting a new Christmas card made this year. So we gotta get us all together to take a picture. Hey, thanks for joining me. I'm hoping to have all my usual periscopers. Oh good, I was hoping you'd be on grandma. That's awesome, I see my grandma, 92 years old, and she's periscoping from California, so that's so exciting. <laughs> welcome, Grandma, welcome. Uh, hi, Claire, hey, Wendy. How's everybody doing today? We have got a beautiful day in Dallas. It's a little rainy. Hi, Janice. Oh, you're new, okay. Hi, Mitzi, so nice to meet you. I'm Trina. I'm Trina Titus Lozano, and I'm a counselor and an ordained Christian minister, and I live in Dallas, Texas, and I just really had a great morning um, with the Lord, and God just led me to um, tell you guys my life story today. I've never done it on Periscope, and I just figured it would be a good day to just get it out there and just tell my whole life story. Hey, thanks, Kim. I washed my hair today just for just a... Uh, because it was the time. <laughs> I, I consider the dry shampoo not going to lie. And I'm like, hey, I should just wash my hair today and be done for the weekend. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else says that. Once on Friday and I'm good till Monday. It is a little rainy, but I'm loving the rain. We needed the rain here in Dallas, so it's cool. I'm looking outside, actually, and it's good. We need that. We really need it. It is Friday, so happy Friday, y'all. Um, good, good to hang out with you guys today. Good to see you. You guys, I'm just going to tell you, I am not going to rush today. So normally my periscopes are around 10 to 15 minutes, 20 minutes max. Um, I'm a talker and I'm a pretty fast talker. So y'all are going to have to keep up with me, but, um, I periscope twice a day. Oh, hello from Scotland. I periscope twice a day at noon and nine, and I've been doing this since this summer, and I really love it. It's really something that refuels me, and it's a way that I can just connect with people all over the world. So thank you for joining me, all of you um, from all over the world, and it's awesome. Um, I can't talk slow. It's just not who I am. Every once in a while, I try to slow down, but y'all are just going to have to learn to listen faster because... It's just not who I am, man. I cannot do it. Um, okay, so you're from Fort Worth. Awesome. And from Brazil, from Beantown. Okay. Um, good, good. Yeah, you are lucky. It's a longer scope today. Hey, Rachel, I'm so glad that you stick with me and that you love my periscopes. By the way, thank you all for the hearts. And if you'd like to share my periscope today, it would be a great day to do it. Just swipe up and down. Um, and then oh, I keep it really clean around here. Swipe, swipe up and down. Um, to share it if you're on an iPhone and then to the right or left if you are on an Android. Thanks for inviting followers, Kendall. I love that. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and really, I appreciate all the hearts uh, also. So y'all, thank you for joining me. And I'm just going to tell you more about myself today than I have in the past. So y'all can comment and just continue to give me hearts as I tell you my life story. Um, and it's really because uh, this scripture was laid on my heart this morning. Oh, hey, Crystal. Good to see you. And thanks for sharing. And, and thank you, Kim, for sharing also. Um, so good. I'm glad that you found me. I, I love Periscope. It's a lot of fun. And I was actually encouraged to tell my story today because of a scripture that I heard someone else telling on Periscope. So she read the scripture on Periscope today. And I thought, you know, that scripture really, it resonated with me this morning. And I just felt like it was a word that God had for me and that I wanted to share with y'all. So um, it says, uh, 2 Corinthians, here's my Bible. Here you go, y'all. <laughs> 2 Corinthians, and that is 1, uh, chapter 1. And I'm just going to read verse 4. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. And y'all know life, life is going to bring us some troubles, okay? We're going to have some good times, some bad times, some ups and some downs. I just turned 50 on September 12th. And, um, you know, I also just saw on Wednesday night that awesome movie, Woodlawn. And that movie, the very first opening scene said September 12th. 1970. So the movie, um, the first scene of the movie was on my fifth birthday. And so I was so able to just go right back to the time of when I was five years old. So ever since Wednesday night, I've been thinking about my life and my whole life story. And um, I was a pastor's daughter. And I just grew up with a great childhood. My parents 
Um, yeah, okay, that was probably her then. Um, it was my first time to happen upon her, so it was great. But um, my parents were pastors, and we lived in Wenatchee, Washington. And Wenatchee, Washington um, is a really small town right in the middle of the state. And we moved there when I think was I was like two years old. My dad had lived there previously, and then after my parents got married and my dad had finished teaching in the Bible college that, that he was at, and then he, he, he and my mom returned to Wenatchee, Washington to pastor a little tiny church there. Well, just like that movie Woodlawn, just like what took place in that movie, in that community and in that time period, really all over the United States for sure, there was a Jesus movement. And the Holy Spirit fell on that place, and God anointed my dad and my mom to minister to this community in Wenatchee, Washington. And hundreds of people would get saved all at the same time. My dad would minister to, um, well, a circus, for instance. I remember the entire band getting saved. Um, I remember an entire... Um, well, my dad has stories of entire football teams getting saved, just like that movie. And and literally, there would be hundreds of people coming to know Jesus on a weekly basis. And our house just had this open door of people coming in all the time. People were getting saved in bars, in restaurants, out uh, on in the in the community, just sitting out on the lawn of the courthouse, in the sidewalks, in the middle of a parade. I mean, it was just people were getting saved all the time. People were, you would just tell them about Jesus and they received him. They wanted to know him. And so as my mom were, my, my mom and dad were a part of this Jesus movement. It was just amazing. The childhood that, that I had as a result of that, I watched miracles happen in my life, in my parents' life and in the life of this church. And this church grew from being a very tiny church to being the largest church in the community by, by several thousand. So the church had around, I'm just rounding out here, around 2,000, sometimes more people in it. And then the whole community was only like a community of 30,000 people. So it was a really large church in a really small community. And um, it was just amazing the way that their ministry impacted that. So I grew up a pastor's daughter, a PK, okay? And um, I was an only child for six years. My brother came along when I was almost six years old. And he came along and... Um, you know, he was my little brother, and I loved having a little brother. But I loved being involved in what my parents were doing. I loved being involved in the church, and we were there all the time, literally day in and day out. Both of my parents were very involved in the ministry. When we weren't at church, church people were at our house. My mom was cooking dinner for them. We were entertaining. She was she was um, doing parties. Then we went to church. My mom played the piano or the organ um, all the time. And um, my dad also played the piano and the organ, and they preached, and they taught Sunday school and they they brought people home with us and I mean they lived they they were the real deal they walked the walk and they talked the talk and it wasn't just church it was a way of life and um so that's the way that I grew up well when I was 15 things had changed things changed in our it really the culture changed the culture changed and and really I think all over the world there began to be um a shift and there began to be a resistance um, to the things of God, and and there was there was um, our church sensed that, and there was um, our business administrator in our church that has had embezzled millions of dollars from our church funds. And my dad had no had didn't know anything about it. My family didn't know anything about it. And when this news came to us, it devastated our family. And I was 15 years old. And I was used to being like the most popular girl in town because my parents were, um, you know, the, the pastors and the ministers of the biggest church in town. And they were so well liked in the entire community. It, it seemed like everybody loved them. And we had a school and an elementary school, a high school, a junior high, a high school, a college um, affiliated with our church were stores and restaurants and the radio station. And we just had this huge movement. We had a dance company and a karate team and a motorcycle um, group. I mean, all out of our church. And we had, I mean, all kinds of things. We had a big Christian arts fair that went on every year that people came from all over the state and really all over the world to participate in this arts fair. And all of this was just such a big movement in our community. And it just came crashing down, bam, like that. And when it came crashing down, it was horrible. My dad went to a severe depression. The community that had loved us so much completely turned against us. 
I mean, turned against the whole church, turned against our family. There was special edition newspapers. There was a criminal trial um, prosecuting the the um, the criminal that had become our business administrator. Of course, we had no idea he was a criminal at the time, but it became very obvious, um, and the court ruled that way. Also, and it was just it was horrible. And my dad doubted his his ability to minister. He doubted his ability to have um, discernment. And it was really awful. So, um, as being as being a a fifteen year old at that time, I mean, you all, there were bricks thrown through our windows, kind of like that movie. There were bricks thrown through our window. Our house was robbed. There was horrible things said to our faces in town. There was it was just really, really, really bad. And we didn't do anything to deserve it. We we didn't do anything differently. But all of this just came crashing down. Um, so when that happened, my mom had just begun um, the year before, a Christian women's magazine called Virtue Magazine. And Virtue Magazine had won many awards, and it was doing very well. So we moved to Eugene, Oregon. We had an opportunity there um, for my mom to continue to work on Virtue Magazine. So my mom continued to do that, and my dad just kind of tried to function in the devastation and the depression. And um, he was ministered to through Jack Hayford and uh, through other people that he was very close to at the time. And um, and we we began uh, part of the Four Square denomination at that time. And Four Square really ministered to my dad. And then my dad was able to minister to people in the Four Square also. And my parents really weathered this storm with grace, with grace, with love, with faith. And they just really held on to all that God had for them, even in the midst of this trial. And gosh, maybe I should have brought some Kleenex. I didn't expect to cry, but you know, I might during this periscope. Um, so, you know, during this trial, I was a 15 year old and my world was devastated. So we, I had to pick up and move. My whole entire life had been I uh, revolved around this church, around this community. Of course, at this point, I had a boyfriend and I was involved in school and I had my own life, so to speak, a little bit. And and so when we had to move, we just, I lost everything, just like my parents lost everything. And then um, later that year, I was a sophomore in high school. And while I was a sophomore in high school, we ended up moving to three different states in my sophomore year. So I'm in 10th grade and trying to learn how to drive, trying to manage my boyfriend relationship. And my dad's in depression. He's in his closet, praying in his closet and be, going between praying and crying and praying and crying and praying and crying. Of course, I can overhear him in his closet. He would come out occasionally and dry his tears and, you know, be part of the family. And then he would disappear again. And we were just all sort of trying to function in this in this process. My mom, in order to cope with the stress, she just really worked harder. So she kept working on the magazine and she kept thinking of projects to do. And she was just got crazy busy at work. And my brother, I don't know what he was doing. He was just hanging out. He was like in fourth grade or something. Um, but we moved from Washington State, Wenatchee, to Eugene, Oregon. We only lived there for six months months and then we moved to Amarillo, Texas. My dad got a call to come be the pastor at Trinity Fellowship in Amarillo. I was 15 years old and I um, I moved to Texas. I had never been to Texas before and it was total culture shock. I didn't know what in the world I had got myself into. I, of course, I didn't have any choice about it, but it was like we moved to a different country. I mean, it was just crazy. The way people talked, the way they dressed. I mean, I really thought that moving to Texas that, you know, I, I had my visions of what it would be like. And I thought, oh, no, it's it's not going to be like that. You know, there won't just be tumbleweeds and, you know, cow pastures and horse pastures and, you know, wide open space and um, you know, a, a oil rig here and there. It won't just be tumbleweeds and dirt and all that. And it was, y'all, it was. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And we moved to Amarillo and it was those things that the movie said. I was like, you've got, I didn't even know it could be for real. People wore Wranglers and belts with a big belt buckle and their name on the back of the belt. And it was crazy. I mean, I was just like, oh my gosh, where have I gotten my, where are we? I mean, all the guys, um, you, you know, had a can of Copenhagen in their back pocket or skull or, you know, and I'm just like, this is so weird. And um, I was 15. I was a teenager trying to navigate this life change. And it truly was, um, it was really bizarre, but it, it became traumatic for me. 
And through the trauma of that, for the first time in my life, I became really angry. I was angry. I was angry at God. I was angry at Christians because it was Christians in our church that I felt like were mean to us and made us leave. And I liked my life the way that it was before. And I just wanted things to be the way they were before. Um, I wanted my boyfriend back. I wanted my church back. I wanted my dad to be the pastor of our old church. I liked it way better than our new church. And so I became I became angry and, and kind of bitter. And so I'm a high I personality. We've been doing the disc temperaments. And so what did I do? I got more sarcastic. I got more mouthy. I got, I got more rude. And I began to just really not care about how I treated people. So I would, I would treat people badly and I would cheat on my boyfriend and, and became kind of promiscuous. And, um, you know, I just didn't really care. And that was for about a year. And then even though I was involved in youth group and involved in school, I was so lonely because I just felt like a misfit. I, I wasn't a Texan and here I am and I don't even get how the world works here. And I talk fast and everybody made fun of me and they couldn't understand me because I was talking too fast. Well, I had news for them. They all talk too slow. <laughs> but it didn't take me long till I learned how to say y'all and then all y'all. And I, I started to fit in and boy, now I've owned it. I'm totally a Texan for sure now. But, um, but God really, um, God really revealed himself to me when I was 16 years old. And at that time in my life, um, I was laying in bed one night and I just remember thinking, you know, God, I'm, I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of cheating. I'm tired of sneaking around and I just don't like my life anymore. I don't like who I've become. So at that point in my life, I really was broken before the Lord. And I just said, God, forgive me. Um, save me. I, I want to be a Christian. And, and so I really humbled myself in my room in my bed when I was 16 years old and, and just said, you know, I do want to serve the Lord. And, um, so I decided, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to compromise anymore. And so I began to get more involved in church and more involved with our youth group. And, and instead of it just being like something that I had to do because I was a pastor daughter, I became really intentional about it and my heart began to really be in it. And, um, I decided, you know, that I wanted to be a leader and that I wanted to, um, I wanted to walk with God. And so then the decisions that I began making sort of been play, were playing out that way. I um, met my husband and a friend from church who brought him over to our house and we started developing a relationship and it was, it was really romantic from the very beginning. And our first date was at an Imperials concert. So, well, oh, you know, if y'all remember the Imperials, an awesome Christian band back in the day, our first date was an Imperials concert and uh, it was several months until we decided to, till I decided that we were really going to date steady, but it didn't take long until I knew that that he was who God had for me to be my husband. And I remember standing in the hall at, at his parents' house and just thinking, you know, his parents and his family, they're the most precious people. And his parents are so awesome. I want them to be my kids' grandparents. Like, I just love his family. And I, my husband's the youngest of six boys. And I loved all of his brothers. And, and a few of them were married. And I just loved their wives. And I really loved my I loved my time when I was with my, with James. I loved my time when I was with his family. And I was standing in the hall at his mom's house and I was looking at some, at a picture, a picture collage of, of James and his brothers and their family on, on the wall there. And I looked at that and just, just like that, I just sensed the Holy Spirit speak to me. This is your husband and this is your family. And so I really held on to that word. Of course, I didn't tell my husband right away. I probably would have freaked him out, but, um, he was, he was only 19 and you know, our day then began to get more serious and he wanted to get serious, but I was a little shy, um, of making that commitment. But then after that, I really made the commitment and I just continued to, um, to let myself fall in love with him and to not resist when he was really falling in love with me. And it wasn't long until we got engaged and I was 17 years old when we got engaged and, um, Jimmy Evans, you might know him. He has an incredible marriage ministry now. And we were one of his very first couples to do premarital counseling with at Trinity Fellowship in Amarillo. My dad was a pastor. And my dad had had recently that um, year put Tom Lane on staff and put Jimmy Evans on staff. Well, maybe just Jimmy first. I think Jimmy might have been first, actually. Anyway, he brought him on staff to... Um, 
be the young Mary's leader and to do premarital counseling. So we were, we were some of the first and it was awesome. So we had a great time in our premarital counseling and Jimmy was obviously gifted and called and you could tell even that in that moment. And I'll never forget, we took a temper, temperament analysis test. And when we took this test, Jimmy said to me, Trina, the results of this test show that you have a very, very extremely low self image. And I had never considered that. Um, I, I had, I mean, I, it surprised me, but then once we continued in the counseling, I could see that when I was really honest with myself, he was right. I didn't feel good enough. I, I wasn't the most popular. I wasn't the prettiest. I was, um, I didn't have very many friends. My friend Tracy uh, usually gets on Periscope and she will, I'm sure, watch this replay. So hi, Tracy, if you're going to watch the replay. Um, so, and, and my friend Amy, Megan, your mom, Tracy and Amy, and I had just a couple of other friends that, that were really, really my only friends because I had moved. And remember, since I was angry and bitter about the move, I, I really put up a wall. And so it, it, um, and I, it was hard. I put up a wall and because I became promiscuous and I became rude and all that. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, that's not really, you know, um, I felt bad. And so all of those things affected my self esteem and affected my self image. And, um, also my parents in their effort to make me really awesome and, and really close to being perfect. Um, I would, I would take their, their input, which, I heard his criticism and really it was the enemy lying to me and I know that now because my parents are so awesome but they but they would give me input of you know ways that I could improve something about the way I looked or the way I dressed or my posture or um, it could be just anything you know just parental um, the way I sang or anything and um, and I filtered it through a lie of the enemy of I'm not good enough and and so when I put that I'm not good enough filter and that lie really uh, began to grow in my mind and in my heart, um, I really began to believe the lie that I'm not good enough and I'm not smart. I'm not smart enough to go to college. I'm not smart enough to graduate from college. I'm not smart enough to get good SAT scores. And I really felt um, stupid. I felt insignificant and I be had become really insecure. So I sort of masked that by being really outgoing and pretending to be confident. But my test scores proved the fact that I wasn't confident at all. And um, so, you know, when I sat that with that reality and that truth, and Jimmy really ministered to me at that time, um, it helped me to grow, to to be, to, to go on a path of just seeking my identity in Christ and seeking my identity through Christ. So I began to really grow spiritually during that time of my life as I, it was the first time in my life that I really began to um, want to grow spiritually. And I mean really grow, like really read the word and really understand more about my identity in Christ. So I really began to own my walk with the Lord at that time. So, um, I grew, my husband and I, um, got pregnant pretty quickly after our wedding. Oh, 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 I have a, um, I have a visual aid here for y'all. Okay. So I don't know if you remember this, but, uh, there we go. 1983. <laughs> so there we are on May 27th, 1983. Isn't that lovely? I'm wearing a hat and a turtleneck wedding dress. What do y'all think about that? Uh-huh. That was very popular at the time. <laughs> Is that hilarious or what? Um, but anyway, my kids love that. But I had a fabulous wedding, and people in Amarillo actually still talk about my wedding. Okay, I'm going to show you all another picture. Just, just maybe another one. Um, I was right out of high school, y'all. Um, okay, so this was Trinity Fellowship in Amarillo in 1983. And uh, I had a fabulous wedding, fabulous reception. And um, okay, here's our whole bridal party. There we go. My grandma's periscoping with us today so she can remember that. Can you believe that? Is that a gorgeous wedding? Y'all, it was almost as pretty as Princess Diana. <laughs> of course, you know, that Victorian look was so awesome. So, you know, it was just a thing. And I was trendy. And so we have, um, you can see the top hats and canes and the, the great big um, 
great big puffy sleeves. And my press, yeah, there you are, Janice. You see yourself? My precious mother-in-law, God bless her soul, made all of our, um, uh, made all the wedding dresses. And she even, she and I together covered the hats. We made the little gauntlets, the like partial gloves. I mean, and I even made these shoe clips uh, to decorate the shoes. I mean, it really was a fabulous wedding. And not only was it well decorated and really fabulous, but y'all, you know, it was great. I was in love. James was in love. And we were really looking forward to our life together. So... We, um, we started our life together in 1983 and, um, and everything was, was sort of as we had planned. I mean, we had a little bit of trials here and there, but we had our first baby, Brooke, the, the next year, actually nine months later, to be honest, right after our honeymoon. Um, I had this weird fear that I wasn't going to ever be able to get pregnant. I, the reason why is when I was little, my dance teacher, um, had, was, had infertility problems. And I remember over her, overhearing her talk to my mom about it. And for some reason, I planted a thought in my head, you know, that I'd never be able to have kids or something, which was really weird. As it turned out, it wasn't a problem. But anyway, uh, so I didn't use birth control. So nine months after our honeymoon, I, um, yeah, exactly, honeymoon baby. But it's great, you know, it's awesome. Brooke is 31 years old now. So, um, and I'm so proud of her. And oh, she was such a joy. And she still is such a joy. Couldn't be more proud of you, Brookie. Um, so anyway, Brooke. And then next was Brandon, and next was Brittany, and then Bryson. So four kids and um, a, a few trials here and there, but a move from Texas to Pennsylvania. My husband started working for IBM, and he worked for IBM for nine years. Then we started our own computer manufacturing company, had that for nine more years. Uh, Lamb System was a successful company. So my husband uh, really became successful in his career, and I was uh, I was a stay-at-home mom and loved that. And our kids were awesome. I mean, there was no big trials, had great pregnancies, great births, you know, all natural and and um, our kids were never immunized and they were never sick and I we just really had a great life my husband was my best friend I was his best friend we we had a we we bought our first little house even before we got married so um, even though there were some trials here and there they weren't like big monumental trials now fast forward till till um, 2002 April 1st 2002 I had the surprise of my life. My husband had been in a severe depression, um, and I recognized that. I knew that he was having trouble with our business partner, and that's all that he would tell me. And um, I didn't know why, but I knew it wasn't resolved, and I knew that it was affecting his demeanor, his attitude. He was he was clearly depressed, no doubt about it. He was shut down, and he was at the office all the time. He would work until 2 a.m., on a regular basis. He would come home from dinner and then go back to work, come home for dinner, go back to work. But he was just gone all the time. And honestly, you know, I, I was used to it. Um, I was busy with the kids. I was busy with my own job and I was used to it. And, you know, I mean, I felt bad for him, but I, I had my life with the kids and with my job. Um, so I didn't really investigate further. Um, and so on April 1st, 2002, he, uh, tells, comes home at like 3 a.m. and it was April Fool's Day, but it was not a joke. And, um, I confronted him. I'm like, something's really wrong with you and it's not okay. Like, you need to get better. This is like, it's, you're, something's wrong. And, and he just said, yeah, um, I filed for a divorce. And so in this really huge fit of rage, he threw me a three page letter that he had typewritten before and at the end of this letter it said I have filed for a divorce and I'm moving out this weekend um he had already filed for a divorce now just let that sink in and I didn't even know we had marriage problems um so I I was devastated um to say I was devastated is like the understatement of the year um, I'm a really outgoing, hyper person by nature, so little things make me hysterical. Well, this, um, I can't even tell you how, how awful it was. I mean, it was just, it was so surreal. Like, what just happened? Who life is, whose life is this? I have no idea what's going on. And I had no answers. Um, and I, I didn't 
think he had been cheating. I mean, I didn't know that he had been. I mean, our sex life was as normal as it, has always, as it had always been. And I just had no clue that we even had marriage problems. Like, seriously, no clue. Well, when he got up in a fit of rage that night, um, he was so loud, and I was so loud, crying and being hysterical, that it, it woke up our three older kids. Our youngest, who was in third grade at the time, it did not wake him up, which was really a miracle. Uh, he was just, he was an exceptionally sound sleeper. Um, but it was really a God thing that he didn't wake up that night because it was so loud. And it was so loud. And I mean, James just told all the kids, your mom and I are getting a divorce. And every, I mean, we were just like, what? I mean, what? I mean, we never missed church. We were very involved in church. We were worship leaders. We were small group leaders. And I mean, we had been for 19 years. I mean, it was just like, what? You know, I mean, we'd had a model marriage, a model family. At this point, our oldest daughter was a senior in high school. She was a senior in high school. She had just turned 18 years old, and our youngest was um, in, in third grade. So I, it was just like, it was unbelievable. So he he moved out to a place that he already had. It was already furnished. He already he had his, he had a whole second life, and I didn't know about it. So in the coming days, I was I figured out, um, and the Lord really directed me to help me figure out. I figured out that he'd been having an affair since Labor Day weekend, so since September, and now it was April. He'd been having an affair, and um, yeah, I just had no idea. So it was with a woman who had three kids. He took them on vacations. He gave her, he gave her, it ended up being about $150,000 that the whole ordeal cost him. Um, he was just trying to be her hero, I guess. And um, he gave her money for her house, for her car. He took them on vacations. He, I mean, he just lived a double life. And I just thought he was doing business trips. I had no idea. Um, so uh, when I found out, I had a choice to make. Of course, I went to see an attorney right away, and the Carvers always watch my Periscope, so I know you'll probably at least catch the replay. And my best friend, Rhonda Carver, went with me to the attorney, and I just sat there like, still, I'm in shock, you know. I just sat there, and we talked about getting a divorce. I mean, he had already filed. What am I going to do? So I talked about what I was going to do. And during that process, God took me to a whole nother level of trusting him. I mean, it it's indescribable to imagine the depth of pain unless you've experienced it. It's indescribable to imagine the, um, you know, just the, the devastation the insecurity that you feel, the the heartache, the disappointment. I mean, the pain is just so tremendous. So, um, but I knew, I knew my Savior. And I knew that Jesus would help me get through anything. And um, I knew that he would help me get through anything and that he would help my kids get through anything. And that we would, we would get through this. And I made a decision you know, I'm not going to be bitter and angry, and I'm not going to be that way. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be bitter, and I don't want to be resentful. So I don't know how this looks, God, but you're going to help me to walk this, and I'm just going to take it one day at a time. So I learned a lot of, I'm going to say, real hardcore life skills, and the word became my Bible, my Bible, it became life to me like, like it had never before. It was always life to me, but not to this extent because I never had a trial, not a really big trial. I watched my parents go through a really big trial, but I had never gone through a really big trial, like really nothing. I mean, I had really had a, basically a perfect life, like no, no trial, no hardships. And... This was just monumental, but it was a time that God and I grew closer together. I was on my face before Jesus. I couldn't function without Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit became real to me, and he gave me the power to get through each day. So as I navigated my way through each day, 
it was a couple months later in June that my husband um, wanted to come home. And I asked God to show me a sign. I just said, God, is this is too risky for me to allow him to come home if he has not really had a heart change and if he's not going to change his lifestyle and his behavior. So I, I just asked God for a sign. I had never asked God for a sign before. I had never... I didn't even know if I believed in that, really. I mean, I had read a few Bible stories about it, but I wasn't really sure if I could throw the fleece out there kind of thing. You know, I was like, I don't know how that works, but I need a sign because it was too big of a deal. Thanks for the hearts, y'all. I know that you're sticking with me. It was too big of a deal for me to have him come home and for us to readjust to that if, if he didn't have a heart change. So I had um, prayed a lot about it. And I got some advice from some people that I had really, really trusted. I got some real good, wise counsel. And as I got some real good, wise counsel, the Lord uh, helped me to make some really wise choices. And um, I just asked for a sign. And the sign was if my husband cried. So if my husband came to me and was able to honestly answer the questions that I had emailed him, There was 20 questions asking him about his heart change and asking him about, about, um, you know, if he was willing to communicate with me because he had completely shut down and there was no communication um, and no counseling. He wouldn't go to counseling or communicate at all. So um, I just said in order for us to even for me to consider us getting back together and um, we have, I got to have some answers. I have to know, are you going to recommit your life to Jesus? Are you going to um, embrace me as your wife again? And there has to be zero communication with with your girlfriend. Um, and I just I I just gave it to God. And on these questions, I also said, um, "Would you be willing to talk about growing up with an alcoholic father?" By the time I met his dad, his dad had become a Christian and he was saved and alcohol had been a thing of the past, but it didn't change the fact that, that his six boys grew up with an alcoholic father and, and at times abusive because of that. Um, their mother is the sweetest lady in the world and she just continued to pray and to, to trust God and to believe for her, her husband to change and to be saved and spirit filled. And he was, and he was radically saved and set free and God totally delivered him from that lifestyle. And he was the most godly, incredible man. And my mother-in-law is an incredible woman, but that didn't happen until my husband was a teenager. So my husband grew up with an alcoholic father, but you know, they never talked about it. They always just said, you know, we're saved now and love covers a multitude of sin. And so they never talked about it. You know, and I just thought at this point I had become a counselor and I just thought, you know, he never talks about his childhood and that's unhealthy. He never cries about anything. And I just it it just dawned on me. I had never seen him cry about one thing the whole time I'd ever known him for twenty over twenty years. I mean, he didn't cry at our wedding. He didn't cry when we have our kids. He didn't cry at funerals. He didn't cry at church. He didn't cry at altar calls. He didn't cry when we watched Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> Y'all, he didn't cry ever. And I'm just like, you know, that's a problem. And it's a problem that he never talks about his childhood, like realistically, like about the tough times. So I wrote those in the questions that he needed to answer. So he asked me out for dinner and I agreed to go. And of course my parents were praying, my in-laws were praying and all my friends were praying, you know, that there would be a heart change. And, um, and I was praying that there would be a heart change too, but I was just praying that God would give me a sign so I wouldn't make a mistake by taking him back when he, when his heart hadn't changed. So, um, I, I asked God for a sign that he would cry. And in that dinner, while we were at a very fancy restaurant, the nicest restaurant in town, he was, he was reviewing the questions and he was giving me the answers. Very hard for him. He's not a communicator. Um, but he did. He was giving his answers and he was, he was sorry. And he said that he was sorry for the affair and sorry for what he had put us through. Um, but it was just like simple. And he didn't cry when he said he was sorry. But then when he got to the question about talking about his dad, he began to weep. 
and he literally wept uncontrollably, like convulsively. He's like, he's like, ha, 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 he's like crying convulsively. And as he's crying convulsively, he's creating a scene in the restaurant and he had to excuse himself and leave. We had already ordered our food, so I had to like pay for the food and get it to go. And then I met him in the parking lot in the car and he wept for hours that night, like literally hours convulsively weeping. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, God, I think we had a misunderstanding here. I asked for a sign for him to cry, but I wanted him to cry about me. <laughs> I wanted him to cry because he was so sorry about what he did to me and to our family. I never considered that the tears would be about anything else. Like that wasn't even a thought in my head. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But yet the sign was there that his heart was soft. And the only thing I asked God for the sign was that he would cry. And if he cried at that dinner, then I would take him back. That's what I told God. And I'm like, oh, God, you did your part. Like you made him cry. The Holy Spirit should work in his heart. And I'm like, now I'm going to have to take him back. And I knew that I had to take him back because I got the sign that the Lord gave me. And so I was just like, okay, God, I'm just going to have to trust you in this. So, of course, I have to trust God in everything. I saw the question a little bit ago, how did he win his trust back? Well, you know, y'all, I learned a lesson that nobody could have ever taught me. Nobody could ever tell me. And it was like, this is a tough lesson to learn. The lesson I learned was that trust is actually a gift because I was going to have to love and trust him. Trust is an extension of love because, y'all, I read 1 Corinthians 13 over and over and over and over and over and over again. I read my Bible and, y'all, I'm looking for a loophole here because I did not want to take him back. I mean, I didn't. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He lived a double life for real for that whole time. We, he had caused us to be, he used all of our money, like everything and, and lying day in and day out. I mean, it was like so much to handle. He was divorcing me to marry another woman. He took her and her kids on vacation. I mean, the whole thing was like so ridiculously, unbelievably horrible. I, I couldn't even fathom forgiving him. But I couldn't find a loophole biblically because I would read 1 Corinthians 13 over and over and over again. And I'm like, okay, God, I made vows at my wedding day <laughs> to love. We had 1 Corinthians 13 sung beautifully at our wedding by the Hawaiians. We were a professional singing group at the time. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, like, how am I going to do this? But God showed me that I could trust him, that I could trust Jesus with my life and that I could trust him so that no matter what, no matter how uncertain my future seemed and my life seemed, that I could trust Jesus. And I just saw Paula Pandren joining. Hey, Paula. And so that's right. To have faith in something that I couldn't see and I would read the Bible and I would just say, you know. I know I can't see it, and but I know it's real. I believe it's real, and I believe I can trust God no matter what. So God showed me the sign. I'm going to let him come home. So he did come home, and y'all, we, we moved to Texas. He expressed his strong desire to move back to Texas. So we sold our company, and we moved to Dallas. I said, we're not moving back to Amarillo because we got to move forward. We got to move forward. We're not going backward. We used to live in Amarillo. We're not going back. We're going to, we're going to go forward. And I honestly fasted and prayed. And if you're Christians, you know what that means. Um, I just prayed and prayed and prayed. Y'all, when I fasted and prayed, you know, it was serious business. And our kids were at camp and I just told my husband, I'm going to fast and pray. And I said, God, I'm going to have to do it again. I'm going to have to have a sign because I cannot. I can't make this move all like leave our home, the home that we had built. I had a business, a successful business. I was, um, I was actively counseling and teaching along with my, along with my, um, retail store. And it was just like, like, I like my life here. Our daughter was already going to college in Boston. 
she had just graduated from high school. I was just moving her to college in Boston. Um, and my son was a junior in high school. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't, I didn't want to move him and devastate him and traumatize him the same way I have been traumatized when I was a teenager. I'd always said I would never do that to my kids. I would never make them move when they're teenagers. And here I am faced with this. And my husband, who's been completely unstable for the past year, he's wanting to move. Thanks for the hearts, y'all. Really appreciate that. Um, and so I just said, okay, God, one more time. I'm going to have, I'm going to need a sign. So I told my husband, while the kids are at camp, I'm just going to lock myself. Well, not seriously lock myself, but I'm just going to go and clean out the garage, clean out the attic, clean out the kids' closets. I'm going to be in serious cleaning mode while I'm fasting and praying. And I'm not having a conversation with you for a couple of days until this weekend is over. And so I fasted and prayed and I just said, you know, God, I cannot move. I cannot leave the security of my home, of my job, of my friends to go to a place where I know nobody. And God was, you know, saying that Dallas, Texas would be the place. Well, we knew nobody here. We'd never lived here before. We didn't know anybody. We didn't have jobs. We didn't know, we didn't know anybody. So, and I'm in such an insecure place in my life. How in the world am I going to function with having zero support system? At this point, my parents were pastoring a church in Ohio. Um, so I just, I didn't even know how that would be possible. But I just say, God, if you give me a sign, I promise to trust you. And so I just said, I hate to have to ask for a sign again, but I don't know what else to do. Because I just, like, I got to know, you know? So, um... I mean, if it's one thing, if it was just me, but me and four kids and a husband that's like, you know, like semi gone crazy last year, it's like, I got to know, I need a sign. So, um, cause he, I, I didn't even really feel like I knew who he was. I mean, he wasn't who I thought he was, so I don't know what the heck, but anyway, it was just so, so difficult to make this decision. So I'm like, okay, God, I got to have a sign again. So I was cleaning and while I was cleaning, I asked God for a sign. I said, okay, God, you know, my biggest concern, honestly, is Brandon because, because of his age. Um, he's going to be a junior, and he's he was already angry about even the thought of us moving. He was so angry at his dad. Um, he was already going, we were already going through family transition because our oldest was leaving for college and she said to stability in our home and she was leaving and I'm just like, you know, God, here's the sign. If you tell Brandon that it is your will for him and for me and for James and for Brooke, Brandon and uh, uh, Brooke, him, Brittany and Bryson if you tell him that it is your will for us to move to Dallas, then that'll be my sign. So I said, God, while he's at camp, right now, while he's at camp, you speak to him. And you then, I'm telling God this, you know, y'all, I was desperate, okay? I don't normally tell God what to do, but I was desperate. I need to sign. So I'm like, God, if you tell Brandon while he's at camp, that we're supposed to move to Dallas. And if he comes home and tells me that, then that'll be my sign and I'll know. Well, I told James, I don't know. God didn't tell me if we're supposed to move or not. And so I'm not going anywhere until he tells me. Well, I didn't tell him about the sign. I didn't tell anybody about the signs between me and God. And I'm thinking that will never happen. It's never gonna happen. Like my whole, the police I threw out there, like it's not gonna happen. Well, y'all, it was two weeks later. It was, seemed like a long period of time. It was two weeks later. And on the way home from Hershey Park, Brandon was working at Hershey Park, and he had his uh, permit. So I picked him up, and uh, we were driving home together. And on the way home that day, Brandon said to me, and I quote word for word, y'all, it's like it happened yesterday, and it was in 2002. He says, Mom, while I was at camp, I was praying with Bill Stetler and God spoke to me and told me that we are supposed to move to Dallas and that he has a plan for each one of us to move and we need to move to Dallas. 
And then he said, I have a song for you. And then he played this old Stephen Curtis Chapman song that I had in my car. Uh, I'm a sucker for Christian music, okay? And uh, yeah, sometimes cheesy Christian music. And um, it's, he played the song, Stephen Curtis Chapman song that was Sink or Swim, I'm Diving In. I don't know if y'all know that. Uh, so uh, I'm diving in, I'm diving in. So Sink or Swim, I'm diving in. <laughs> And he just said, Mom, that's our song. Like, sink or swim, we just got to dive in. Like, we just got to dive into this move. Sink or swim, we're diving in. And then I told him the story about that I had asked God for a sign and that that was a sign I asked him for. So I was like, okay, when we get home, I'll start packing. So we got home, y'all, and I began to pack and clean out closets. I told James and, and the rest of the kids about what I just told y'all about the sign and how God had revealed to us that we were supposed to move to Dallas. And um, so we, Brooke was sort of indifferent about it because she was getting ready to go to college. The other kids agreed that they would come with us and we would come on a trip to um, Texas to find a house. So we, um, we hopped on a plane, James and I and the three kids that would be moving, and we came to Dallas. My dad said right before we left, you know, Trinity Fellowship, remember the church that he had previously pastored, and Jimmy Evans have been a part of sponsoring a church plant that is in Grapevine, meeting in a preschool. It's called Gateway Church with Pastor Robert Morris. Y'all should check out that area. So we did, and we checked out that area. We went to Gateway Church, which was meeting in a preschool temporarily in Grapevine, Texas, and uh, we still attend that church today. And... That helped us decide what area of the Metroplex to move to. So we went to the church, and then we, we looked at about 30 houses that weekend, y'all. We were going crazy looking for homes. And we uh, made an offer on four different homes. And this house that I'm sitting in right now was the only place that accepted our offer. And the people that were selling it put it on the market the day that we were flying out of town. It was the last house that we looked at, the last offer that we made. They accepted our offer. We had only seen the house one time, and I mean, it was a quick run through because we had to catch a plane, and we got on the plane. They accepted our offer. We got home, and um, I made one phone call, one phone call, and I called up a girl that went to church with us whose husband was... Uh, taught at the, the kid's school, and he was my kid's science teacher and wrestling coach. So I called Wendy, and I said, hey, Wendy, would you and Chad be interested in buying our house? We're moving to Texas. Wendy said, yes, we want your house. And I said, would you like to come see it? Y'all, they had never been to our house. And she's like, yeah. So I said, okay, I'll cook dinner. Um, we'll grill some steaks on Friday night. Y'all come over, see the house, see if you want it. She said, no, we do want it. And I was like, okay, we'll come over and we'll figure out a price. We'll make it happen. They came over for dinner and they, they bought our house, y'all. And so our house was sold just like that with one phone call. And Chad and Wendy still live there. So, Wendy, I hope that you're watching this Periscope. Catch the replay at least. Um, because God had that house for Chad and Wendy and for their two beautiful children. And they have raised a beautiful family there. And they've made such an impact in that community. And that was the house that we built, that we dedicated to the Lord. You know, and it just has continued to bless that family in that community. So God did have a plan. Then when we moved to this house, um, it was the biggest step of faith I've ever done. Talk about trusting God on a whole nother level. Well, it was. And um, we got here, and we made a couple of phone calls. People that we had heard had moved here from Amarillo. We called Gordon Dunn. Uh, hopefully, Gordon and Kathy will at least catch this replay. We called Gordon and said, hey, we're moving to Dallas. And he's like, hey, okay, me and my kids will be there. We'll help you unload the truck. And, you know, they did. They helped us unload the truck. And we didn't see them for quite a while after that. But, man, they were here that day that we needed it. Not only that, a good Another family that had been friends of ours in Amarillo and had even spent some time in Ohio and our kids had reconnected. Um, they had visited us in Pennsylvania. We had gone to Hershey Park together. Our kids had reconnected. They had moved here and they came over and helped us. So our kids instantly had a friend here. It was awesome, y'all. It was just amazing. 
So God made a way when there seemed to be no way. Y'all, that's going to be the end of my story for today. But tonight at 9 o'clock, I'm going to pick up from the time that we moved in our house in October. So exactly this month. You guys, I had to go back and look. It might have been on this day today. I have to go look. I cost, I, I've always said October, for I forget the exact day. But exactly this month in 2002, God gave us this house. And you know, he sustained us through bankruptcy, mental illness, sickness, clinical depression, and all kinds of other trials. And we have a lot to testify about, and I've got a lot to testify about. So I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story, bringing you up to the present at nine o'clock tonight. Thank you all for watching my Periscope, and thank you for being interested in my life story, because the reason why I wanted to tell you this today is because when we go through trials, it is for a purpose, like the scripture that I read at the beginning of this episode. It is for a purpose, and that purpose is way beyond me. It is about me and my family, and it's also about you and your family and your life and your marriage, and I'm here to encourage you because if I can trust God, y'all, you can too. I just want to know he can be trusted. God bless y'all. I love you too, Kim. Oh, you're such a blessing to me. I love your family. And I just want to encourage y'all today that Jesus is real and you can get through anything because he can be trusted. I will be back at nine o'clock tonight. Thanks for periscoping with me. God bless you.